<laughs> well, Tom, writer, satirist, f- Foghorn and Pest, that's, a, that's some bio. Foghorn and Pest, that's it. That's great. That's uh, how I self-describe, self-identify, yep. Great to, great to uh, have you here for, for a little yarn and thank you for your time. I know you're incredibly busy at the moment and you've got a lot on your plate, so I appreciate stealing a little bit of that on a Wednesday evening shockingly busy right now but just you know this is what happens when you sometimes watch these these movements that seem to just nab the news as attention and you know grab all of us by the neck and force us to watch them you know so it gets pretty hectic but no i appreciate the invite and it's really good to yarn with you because i enjoy your work josh thanks mate well look for people who don't know do you want to give them a little bit of a of a background of your um your history in i suppose activism which is which is kind of why we're, we're chatting today yeah, sure. So I always sort of blended activism with a bit of commentary, a bit of being a smart ass, and a bit of uh, a bit of sometimes comedy satire stuff. The first thing that I did was in back in two thousand and sixteen, and you may recall back then it was all Reclaim Australia and United Patriots Front, and the Patriot movement at that time was the the big grassroots movement that we all had a, a problem with the rise of in Australia. And at that time, my first I suppose public political creative work was me doing a fake far right group. I wasn't the first one to do that, um, but I I I did a group. Was it the Million Flags? Correct. Yeah, Yeah. Million Flag Patriots. um, Which is why there's a man holding Australia up by his back in the background there for anyone (laughs) thinking, "What is this guy a nationalist?" Well, no, that was just part of that work. Don't worry. (laughs) Accidentally invited a rabid nationalist onto your conversation. yeah, so we were just uh, the the project there was doing a fake far right piss take group that would do everything the real ones did. That was a, a whole story unto itself. But certainly after that, I I, I went into more uh, still very smart ass, but nonetheless anti fascist action groups. I helped found one with uh, activist comedian Sean Bedlam called Yelling at Racist Dogs, which you also see in the background yep. there, and that. Did, well, that did very much what it says on the packet, which was literally just about forming a strike team of people to yell and record inventive abuse uh, towards high-profile organised racists. Again, you know, sort of patriot movement types and organised Nazis, people who would show up at far-right rallies and, and, and that kind of thing. And I suppose through that and, and various other things, I've always been been part of anti-fascist action since then which has meant you know countering far-right rallies back in the old days when those of us who weren't conspiracists used to go and do rallies remember those days remember before the before the end times (laughs) um and uh um yeah so i've got had a lot of experience in the belt i suppose of being an auxiliary to other things but also nowadays i write uh fortnightly articles which are invariably about activism and fringe politics and i do videos about the same thing and 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 i suppose that's how we came to know each other hey that's right yeah you've done some really wonderful pieces on the i suppose the co-opting of the various lockdown complaints by far-right elements and how they maybe are using that to prey on anxious and annoyed and frustrated people and encourage them to take reckless I guess it's hard to call them protests. I find it very difficult to call them protests because they're not, they don't really have a point. They're kind of just aimless wanderings and screaming and whatever. Um, but you, you sort of pointed out with your experience that it's not even just anti lockdown people necessarily that are the ones sort of populating these, these movements, these mobs. And that, that's probably something we should be a little bit concerned about, something we should pay attention to at the very least. Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, Josh, I would take umbrage with the fact that you've said that, you know, uh, walking to the top of the Westgate Bridge and singing Horses by Daryl Braithwaite isn't a protest action, you know? I mean, I know. What, I, I, I would say, look, I, you know, can I say with that thing? It seems more appropriate that they should have sung Tina Arena at this point in time. Now, <laughs> <laughs> because Daryl's, Daryl's part of the Get Vaxxed sort of team and... Tina's the one laying yeah. the boot in at the moment, so they, they, yeah, pick, they should have sung Chains. To, that would have even been more apt. Their, yeah, they <laughs> need to pick their heroes a bit better. Well, look, you know, we've all become champions of self-restraint during the pandemic, haven't we? And that little 
I suppose joyfully anarchic part of me was deeply jealous of them just for the freedom to be able to I mean I've always had this part of me that's always thought wouldn't it be nice to walk over the Westgate Bridge and I never got to do that well they got to do that and I'm actually really this part of me that's really jealous and resentful of them for that you know divorced of any politics you know but um so yeah it's a real it's a real grab bag of different people we're used i think in australia to going oh we talk you know we're used to have the past five years we've become accustomed to saying what are these secret meddling manipulative far-right elements in insert movement here you know because we've seen that we've seen these meddling people in their meddling capacity we've seen them try to infiltrate politics we've seen them try to infiltrate, infiltrate and branch stack the young nationals you know, we've seen fringe neo-Nazi groups uh, uh, orchestrate a, a ter- pretty terrifying rise to prominence throughout last year before crashing and burning. Oh, sorry, throughout the earlier part of this year before crashing and burning spectacularly. So, you know, and of course we've seen all the stuff from America, the insurrection. So we've all gained at least an introductory course in the idea of going, uh, are these people secretly far right? And there's, and to be fair, there was a far right element there, and yeah, I wrote about that to a degree. But you know, I also was, I, I'm really interested in the dynamic of those protests, just because there is something novel that I hadn't seen before, and is what I most recently wrote by for Independent Australia, and it's this idea that there's so, there's like an influencer cast, you know, like this mm-hmm. anointed class of influences at the head of the anti-lockdown movement they're these people who create uh, uh, the content and some of them also encourage people out to the rallies but then they don't take any responsibility for them. Mm. They wash their hands. And that might be to avoid incitement charges. It might be because they just afford themselves the luxury of not caring, you know. It seems easier to not organise something than it is to organise. I can confirm that. Organising activist stuff is not easy, so they just quit, quit. You know, they just rage quit and chill out instead and walk around the rally. And then there's also these live streamers, which, you know, for example, Real Rukshan rose to prominence recently. And, you know, they gain this sort of folk hero status. They definitely bring the people there. I mean, anyone who looked at these rallies over the course of last week will have seen that the live streamers themselves had a huge impact on attendance. And that serves them and their careers, if him or someone like Arby Yemeni, what have you, serves them really well. But once they... But they don't take any responsibility either. Mm. And again, why would why would they? They're there as a, in a purely careerist manner. They deliver biased reporting. They tell the people at those rallies what they want to hear. So those people feel that they're folk heroes. You know what I mean? And and they get to avoid any responsibility as well. But what you end up having is you have these chaotic events. I once I was going to say anarchic. I'm used to that description. <laughs> I'm a, sort of an anarchist myself. So why would I say that? Anarchic doesn't mean that. It means smaller organisation of stuff. Chaotic, really, events where no one can even agree. Half of them want to go down St Kilda Road and go to the shrine. The other half probably don't want to do that. Who wins? Well, just whoever's the loudest and strongest. Half of them don't want to attack the cops. They're going where peaceful. The other half are literally in the middle of attacking the cops. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Both of these things can't be true, but just whoever, because there's no organisation with those events, the you know mob rule in the worst sense of it ends up prevailing. And that's something I think has come up a bit. People are talking about this. Oh, you know, you I I I called it a mob mostly just because it was aimless. And I thought protest yeah. was a bit of an overstep. And then people were like, you're just using mainstream media terminology. But for <laughs> me, for, I mean, apart from the people just love saying mainstream media all the time for no particular reason, <laughs> attached to no particular thing. But you would be called the mainstream oh, media, put it that 100%. way. Just because you don't. Yeah, I notice that. I get it all the time too. I'm like, how the fuck am I anyone's <laughs> mate? I literally like, don't do anything for anyone i know mates i have mates who work in abc and sbs they can't fucking say anything yeah. they have so many fucking checks and balances on them i feel sorry for them i can say anything i want you know what i mean like yeah. anything i could change political sides tomorrow in a minute i you know i just purely i adopt my own line no one tells me what to do you know at all and yet you'll still cop mainstream you still media. get called a shill 
you know. It's code for you don't agree with me. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you've been you've been at protests. You've been involved with protests. You've you've the, the difference between I suppose something I thought would be great for you to explain to people is that when you have the difference between an organised protest with leaders and responsibility and a point, what does yeah. that look like as opposed to a rabble roused? mob of frustrated angry people sort of some people with maybe noble intentions and some people who are there to just take advantage of the fact that there's a mob yeah good question josh i mean you know and, 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 okay so to take one popular example uh maybe many people watching have been to an invasion day rally throughout one of the capital cities you know in, uh, in years previous and and people might remember what they've seen there. They've seen people in high vis coats. You know, maybe that might be a bit triggering right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that they're about to, you know, um, have to change their uniforms for the next something. ones. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're going to have but a no, wears was... Wally stripes or something. Will be the new, be the new outfit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Back in the before the end times, high vis on someone at a rally used to mean. That you were a marshal, you know, particularly in the case of invasion. So look, you know, look at Melbourne; it'll get you know anywhere it can get up to a hundred thousand people, sometimes more, at these enormous invasion day rallies. And people, I by the way, remember that. If you ever think these anti-lockdown rallies are huge, remember what a really big rally looks like. Don't worry. Anyway, so yeah, marshals are people who give shape to a rally. They'll say, "Don't go here." They might form a line. Should there be any interfering pests or what have you, between, you know, like far right people sometimes pop up in small numbers at these rallies. They might form a line there. Um, they will basically act in accordance with a plan that has been sorted out and that they've all negotiated among each other beforehand. So all the marshals will go to a meeting and they'll get their, I suppose, marching orders and their priorities. You know, in COVID era, and there's been a couple of rallies like that, they might also be the people who carry on them sanitizer and so on and so forth. Um, they're meant to be a point of contact for people at the rally and they're also meant to be a way that the will of the organizers and thus therefore the will of the rally is is honed so there'll be lots of them well it depends really you know i mean good rally has a proportionate amount of marshals to the amount going on again going back to invasion day there'll be many 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 people there another important thing is there'll be one or more uh uh police liaisons mm -hmm. now that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, for people with anti-state inclinations, that doesn't mean that you can't talk to the police and, you know, any any decent organiser. And I'm not the guy, but, I've you know, I've been around as an auxiliary to, to many different protest movements. So you can see that this happening, that there's many benefits to organising a police liaison, and that is that you can keep your people safe, you can actually communicate the intent of the rally uh, that you've agreed and negotiated on. You can communicate it to someone at the police um, you might therefore get them to stave off their violence. If indeed you want to be able to march down this street, you can negotiate that with a person in, in, in place there and it might hold the police off from doing anything rash. And if we've seen over the course of the past week, we might have seen a lot of rash anti-lockdown movement members, but we also saw a lot of rash and really violent police officers as well. You ask someone like me, I say that they're, well, you know, they're... they're it, it's... It's legalised, institutionalised violence. It's okay to to exercise that kind of violent will as a police officer, as part of the riot squad or something like that. So yes, they have the capacity. They also have the capacity to go overboard. We all know that. I hope. So you need liaisons for reasons like that. You can also um, stuff the cops. <laughs> you know, I'm not reveal. I'm not revealing any great secrets here. You can stuff the cops around with police liaisons. You can waste copious amounts of their time. You can do all kinds of interesting stuff. But you'd be better to have it there than to not if you know there's going to be lots of police. And, hey, these days there's always lots of police at any big rally. Legal observers is another thing, you know what I mean? Not just, and I don't mean like live streamers. I mean people with legal experience who can provide legal assistance and can actually then will be bear witness as a trained legal observer to for example, acts of police violence. 
Um, so there's that sort of thing. There's like organisers themselves. There might be one or a group or a committee or something of people. You know, it doesn't have to be one, you know, head figure, head honcho. You know, look at Occupy Wall Street. That was an example of a movement where everything, in fact, sometimes to was detriment, it was onerously so, everything was decided by committees, you know, but it was trying to form a big successful movement based upon anarchist principles, which is where groups of people all decide everything. So it's not like it hasn't been done before. You don't have to have one person heading it up. Groups of people like that. Um, and one other thing, you know, there's many other things that could sure we could do. One other thing, fucking medics. Yeah. You know, because if you look at these things, everyone's getting pepper sprayed, tear gas, God knows what happening to them. And you might at, get, at best get one bloke who's gone and bought a two litre of milk and he's pouring it all over your face. I've seen people applying oil, and I'm not a medic, I'm not a pro on this, but you don't put oil on pepper spray. It traps the capacitin in the skin, which is the active ingredient. I know that just from having caught a little bit of the peps myself in the past <laughs> at rallies. You know, you you learn what what is what is right and wrong. Um, you know, and medics and they keep people safe and they can give people emergency, uh, you know, assistance because who else is there for you in a rally? You know, there isn't St John's Ambos people wandering around there. You need people that protect each other. And what I've always said of this movement, that pisses me off almost more than anything, is that they haven't organised any of those things. Yeah. Oh, no, I know there's been the occasional foray into it or attempt to do it, but then these fucking would-be organisers will go and completely change the location of the rally two hours before it happens, ruining any effort at any kind of cohesion or structure, you know? So you do that, and you're essentially endangering your own people people that you've got to come out to these events and you're letting them decide what they want to do on the day and particularly the other big problem and I've always whinged about this with them as well is like they don't agree on any tangible goals yeah having a point is is an important part of a of a protest one would imagine yeah you've got to have demands yeah. don't you you know yeah. but if you, if you listen to those live streams you look at anti-lockdown people They've all individually got different ideas of why they're there. That's fine. I'm sure the same is the case at, at, at you know, and, and if you look at videos of baiting smart asses like Arby Yemeni and the like who make their content out of this, you can. You can go along to a January 26th Invasion Day rally and you can hear a different answer from them there. If you, from the, them there as well. You know, that yeah. happens. You know, when you get lots of people together, they all have different ideas. So we know that. But that wouldn't matter, and that wouldn't stand out to us so much if there were cohesive overall demands. But there, there actually isn't. They change all the time. Just as, just they change their ideas of what they're rallying for all the time. Just like they change their uniforms when they're um, changing which industry they're pretending to be next. You know? Yeah, <clears throat> and I guess all of those things missing from the current, I suppose, mobs that we've seen really lend themselves to sort of proof that it's not a real protest, that it's a moment, an overflowing of, or a co-opting of everyone's anxieties and frustrations and annoyances, plus some people that are looking for an excuse to run around and have a go at cops and smash some stuff and have their moment on the Westgate and do all those things together. And there's some genuine frustration, there's some genuine concern, there's also some genuine sort of co-opting and there's some genuine people in there who are just like here's a chance to run a muck let's just go on and do that yeah and that this is the thing and this is where it's uh, you know we've got to remember that yeah th this movement has had demonstrated more than once a great capacity to swell to accommodate people who've just had some really bad news from a state government Premier or Chief Health Officer or you know, petty bureaucrat in charge of you know one department or another, and and there has been you know I mean the lack of support for people to stay at home, which in twenty twenty one has been not non existent but patchy at best, and I just heard today that they're planning to phase it out. Yeah, they're phasing certain, it out straight up. Yep. Yeah, they're going to phase it out once certain double vax targets are hit, and if you look at anywhere around the world where there's been 
um, you know, high vaccination rates and you can see that Delta continues to spread in those situations, you think to yourself, well, if you're going to continue to lock down, what I think we've learned from looking around the world is that lockdowns don't really actually work and thus they were abandoned by many parts of the world, really strict ones like we've been doing them. Anyway, they don't really actually work at all unless you're paying people to stay at home. I remember that time when Brad Hazard admitted and then almost tried to correct himself at the time he goes oh well you know the spread of the virus isn't really from people breaking the restrictions so much as it is from essential workers well maybe if they had to stay at home then the actual you know measures to try and limit the spread of the virus might have actually worked and they wouldn't have had to have been in lockdown for so long if you're going to do the lockdown do it properly yeah support the people you have to actually support people to be able to do that. So when that didn't happen in Western Sydney, suddenly we saw tens of thousands of Middle Eastern people and others, you know, just multicultural communities from Western Sydney all come out. Um, and they had very real concerns. And for whatever reason, they felt that no one else was there accommodating their requests. You know, yep. they had great anxiety. Um, they they were there for that, and we yeah we can't we can't forget that there's been many many people with many many decent reasonable requests who've been absorbed by that movement. It's just such a shame that the movement that's loud and flashy and in the community enough to grab many people like that on board is ultimately not doing anything with their concerns. Because hey, I would. I said this after the Sydney thing. This may seem irresponsible, but if 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 all of those forty thousand people who went to that park in Camperdown or wherever it was and then marched into the city, you know, a month or two ago in Sydney, if they were all saying, "Give us the return of JobKeeper and jo- increased JobSeeker right now," or we'll basically turn into like a weaponized COVID distribution army. <laughs> I, that doesn't sound like a good idea. I'd be like, no, please don't. You know, in the sense that you don't yeah, want that public to health sense to yeah. the community. In the public health sense. But also, I imagine the government might have been forced to listen somewhat. And when I see, when I see them instead just going, ah, NWO, then I think what a wasted, what, a, what an actual wasted, what a waste of genuine frustration and, and political will, you know? Well, and it's ultimately being wasted on a movement that at its heart is... I don't think it's... A, it's if you say it's at its heart a far-right one, you're ignoring the um, the tens of thousands of multicultural people that have gone there. You know, yeah, I see course. them. I, every time, I, every rally, I see them, you yeah. know? I, I, you're ignoring the, in, the indigenous communities that run some of them. You know, the smoking ceremonies run by... I know it ain't comfortable to say it. I know we're all used to going, oh, you know, far right equals bad, therefore bad protest movement equals far right. However, ignoring the multicultural reality of it, you know. Um, So it's not fundamentally far right at its heart is what I'm saying. What it is fundamentally is conspiracist. And conspiracist movements are just about the trade of all these different anxieties and information, and that may have a f- factor in 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 making people feel like they have a bit more agency during a pandemic. But it's not getting anything. It's not netting anyone anything. Why? You know? Why do the? Why would the organisers or the agitators, instigators, you know, these figureheads? Why would they continually encourage then frustrations in the direction of people who don't control the thing that you're frustrated at, i.e. state premier RE JobKeeper? You know, like why send everyone to yell at Dan about JobSeeker when that's a federal responsibility and why not send them to Kuyong to go outside Frydenberg's office and have a word to Josh? That's a great question. Or in a more recent example, if you are angry over government mandates, why are you attacking a very prominent union? And you and you can you can imagine that some of the answers for that lie in the politics of some of the organisers. For example, I said they're not all far right, but the person who put that rally on uh, is, and he <laughs> does have connections to the Nazis, Harrison McLean, yeah. and. You know, I see it as a bit of a zinger. Now they're doing doing this little game, which, you know, far-right people love to do. They're now co-opting union slogans and they must be rubbing their hands together thinking the left are really going to hate this. I know what they're like, you know. Um, But they're they're attacking unionism 
as part of 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 onboarding a platform of far right politics into that movement, you know, because that particular organizer, that is his background and that is his connections and and, and you know people with a far right uh, uh, history to them you know, far right inclinations. Well, they are all thinking about, okay, I've come across this big populist uprising thing now. How can I make that look a bit more far right? You know, how could you do it in this case where you could turn all that confused, latent, directionless political will, turn it on a union, you know? As you say, you know, maybe it would be better turned on the federal government or what have you, but maybe the federal government, maybe the the, the other, some of the other organisers within the anti-lockdown movement would prefer that it get turned on unions and labour governments and things like that. I've got my endless disagreements with the way that Daniel Andrews has managed the various elements of the pandemic, or particularly with policing the pandemic. And after all, the reason that all those coppers look like Robocop is because his government militarised them mm. over very sometimes as as a mandate after various elections you know I'm a lefty to the core but sometimes being a lefty to the core is saying well Daniel Andrews gave us Judge Dreads and Robocops out on the streets and do we like that as lefties I don't yeah. you know so yeah I guess I know I know you've got to race off and you've got and you've got a you've got a few things to do and I know that this will probably come up from people who aren't sure but have heard it before when people yeah. people often throw the the antithesis to the far right is well what about antifa terrorists and stuff which is sort of an americanization of the discussion but as an anti-fascist yeah. do you want to yeah. do you want to give the quick spiel about how you're not the same and not a terrorist sure i think when people lots of people say that they don't like anti-fascism they've been um onboarded by or, or you know what they, what they're really saying is that they don't agree with a tactic or two. For example, they might have seen footage from America of people in black block, and black block is a tactic it's where you dress up in black, you put the mask on, yeah, which we all funnily enough do nowadays. We all put the mask on, but hang on, you all headed out and you will aggressively get involved. You might get into fights and what have you. You might do something to that end with uh, far right fascist types. Um, so that's a tactic. People, are, you're fine to say, and indeed there are parts of the left that say they disagree with that tactic. You know, you might have your reservations about the tactic of doxing people. For example, there might be a Nazi, you know. Who's the last, last big doxing I saw? It wasn't anti-fascist. It was 60 Minutes. Yeah, that was... That yeah. was <laughs> Yeah, the mob out in Roeville the, and Frankston and whatever that they. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it wasn't you know it wasn't us lot. It was the it was a television station. They were doing the doxing. You know, I don't think they think it's doxing when the mainstream media does it. They seem to think that it's just a big reveal. You know what I mean? And it's just when it's fringe elements that it's it's doxing. It's a strange standard. So these are some tactics. Well, what I would say to you is that all anti-fascism anti-fascism is is a series of tactics. Actually, historically, you know, anti-fascism is a loose collection or, or uh, uh, you know, like combining of different types of other people. You know, socialists, you know, you might have unionists, you might have anarchists, you might have this, you might have the greenies, this and that. Anyone, you know what I mean, will come together against some sort of a far-right formation. And, and historically as well, that's bolstered by the fact that when that far-right organised far-right threat wanes, usually anti-fascists will start bickering with each other and falling out as well because they actually often share quite little in common. So what I'm getting at is that really anti-fascism is a series of tactics that's meant to undermine or stop or thwart very specific threats. One thing that gets said about arts anti-fascists is the, well, the far left. We call everyone a Nazi. No, I, own, I know who a Nazi is better than anyone. You know, everyone else does that. Us lot, anti-fascists, we know exactly who Nazis are. We don't call anyone a Nazi except for an actual proper Nazi. I would never do anything of the sort. And that's because I've had years of experience in looking at what actual Nazis do. Anti-fascism is meant to be very clear-headed, target-focused, goal-oriented, um, you know, series of tactics 
that that are involved, you know, when you look into people. And to prove that, how many anti-fascists of that sort of like American flashy sort, which, you know, sometimes I have reservations when I look at US anti-fascism myself. It's very different. It's just because US Americans are very different. So, yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. They do everything really flashily and overboard, you know? You might say they're anti fascists are violent in the streets there, but their Proud Boys are constantly attacking women and this and that in the street there, you know? America's just a scary place to be, I think. But, you know, look at the past few years in Australia. We've had anti fascist researchers that I know have saved people's lives through some of the stuff that they've found out about in the past, mm. you know? And we're talking about researchers, people who do quiet work. You never know, you'll never know who they are because it's not safe for them to, to put their identities out there. But they've literally saved lives. And we should be grateful that they're there. And if the idea of that, if the idea of, of researchers out there finding out about potential violent terrorists let's say you know far right ones in australia if the idea of them you know finding out about that and doing that hard work in in quiet without ever being known to anyone because they want to protect people from that kind of threat if the idea of that resonates with you then frankly anti-fascism resonates with you because that's all it is it's about choosing the best tactic for the time you know and and we're always we'll always change what the tactic is. If you want to have conversations about specific tactics and what have you, then you're always welcome to have them in the house of anti fascism. It can be a broad church, my friend. It can yep. be a much broader church than all these far right and alt right parasites with media channels ever say about us, you know? We're actually quite we're a pretty down to earth lot. And if people want to see more of your stuff Yeah. You've put a lot of work into a particular little piece. I have, I have, I have. I've done, I'm, I'm doing a, so Melbourne Fringe uh, 2021, I have a show coming out called Anti-Lockdown Ode, which is, well, it's kind of about like how there's only two places in the pandemic and one of them is home. <laughs> and it's set in the early pandemic, actually. One of them is home, the other one is supermarkets. And all we ever do, in, particularly, in, you recall last year, I mean, a lot of us are still the same now, but back in the early pandemic, it was our first time moving between these two spaces. And one of them, in one of them, you get really anxious from looking at conspiracists on your phone. But also, you remember how there used to be lots of supermarket fights? Yeah. Uh, the videos yeah, of that yeah. in 2020? Yeah. Well, okay, so I, I started dwelling on the idea that what does it do to the soul if the only two places are the place where you watch supermarket fights and the only place you're allowed to go to is the supermarket. So it's dwelling on that and there's fun things in there like a supermarket meditation and I do stage a meltdown towards the end of it which is always fun. I always love doing that. So it's kind of like an arty show with a little bit of the commentary I do in there. I would love it if you all come along and watch it and that's from the 5th to the 10th of October. It's a digital show so you can watch it online. And I've, I went and looked at the tickets. You buy a ticket for like a 6 p.m. showing and then you just sit down at 6 p.m., watch it, crack a, totally, crack a tinny and yeah. watch it at home? Exactly. In the same way that you might do with, um, you know, sort of any other kind of event that you'd book into watch <laughs> via Zoom throughout the pandemic. It is scheduled at a particular time, 6.30 on all of those days. I am adding an 8.30 one just because I've got a few parents who've said to me I can't come when I'm putting kids to bed and such. So I am doing that, so keep an eye on my page. But yeah, um, I'll be posting about that regularly over the coming week as well. So come and follow me on any of my pages. I'm Tom Tanicky. We'll uh, link all the things. I'll pop the link. I'll pop the handles and all the stuff and the link, you know, Thank blah, you. blah, blah, and all the things. Click on the things. And mate, thanks for your time. I know it's incredibly busy, busy for you at the moment and I appreciate it. And, you know, we try and find the, the voices of uh, people that have, got a bit of time in, paid a bit of attention for a while and sort of know what they're talking about rather than the, like you say, the conspiracist bandwagon sort of jumper honorers that are yeah. just trying to stoke a bit of anxiety and I appreciate your messaging and the work you've, you've done today and the insight you bring to the current situation as well and um, I look forward to seeing the Ode to Lockdown and uh, hopefully having another yarn with you. I'm sure we could go, we could go for hours, so have, having another yarn in the not too distant. I appreciate it. I'd be happy to come on any time, and I really appreciate it. I've um, been really nice talking, and, yeah, I really enjoy your content too, so it's excellent to be able to yarn with you. Thanks very much. Good on you, mate. Thank you.